Good morning, church. Good to see all of you. Um, today we'll be reading from Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 20. That's Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 20. Um, if you're able, would you stand to read the word of God together? Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 20. And God says, And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. Let's pray. The Father, we anticipate the second coming of Jesus Christ. Just as you promised, you will come to complete your kingdom. But until then, we wait for you in remembrance of who you are and what you did for us. So today, as we take the bread and drink the wine, help us to not just do a ritual, but help us to take in all that you are, your body and your blood, what you consider to be good, what you consider to be righteous, what you think is important. Help us to take all that in and stand for your kingdom, for the one that we love, you. Let this worship once again be our step forward to live by faith. We thank you for giving us an opportunity to do that. And we lift up your name for your glory. And we pray all this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Uh, uh, this morning, we want to, I wanted to, us to remember the eternal hope that we have and the inheritance that we have, the inheritance of eternal life, which is that we would know Jesus and that God sent him. And we have a hope of heaven. And so, uh, as we sing these songs, I just want us to remember and to grasp onto the hope that we have. So um, if you're not standing, we'll stand, we'll start.
Though now tired and warm, we will spend eternity around our Savior's throne. Though we grieve our losses, we grieve not in vain. For we know our crown of glory waits beyond that grave. On that day, we will see you shine brighter than the sun. On that day, we will know you as we lift our voices one to that day. For your never-ending grace, we will keep on singing on that glorious day.
on that day you join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and all that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations so worthy is the land we were slain. grace and strength to love you and to worship you. Testing. All right. Good morning, church. Um, yeah, as we got seated, why don't everyone take 30 seconds? Let's greet one another, welcome one another in Christ to worship the Lord this morning. Okay, we do have some new faces. Welcome to Savior Community Church. My name is John. I'm one of the leaders here. Um, it's great to worship with you. Um, I have a few announcements that I want to share for this week and today. Um, first one is going to be for communion. So we're going to take communion today. You should have a little cup uh, by your seat. If you're in the back, we have a basket uh, that you can grab one. We just wanted to make sure the kids doesn't, don't start opening a bunch of them. Uh, if you're at home, please prepare your own elements for communion. That's going to be after the sermon. Our next announcement is going to be for a members meeting that is scheduled for today. Um, I just have a quick update. It's kind of an important one. Uh, Sam messaged me this morning, and he said that um, he's having some chest pains. So he went to go check it out, and uh, he seems to be okay. He's been messaging, keeping me updated a little bit, but I want to just take some time to pray for him. I think it's important for us to entrust um, just his health to the Lord and, and everything. And so he told me he still wants to make it for the meeting later. Um, I told him, you know, like, you got to take care of yourself, and we'll figure it out. So 
I'll keep you guys posted. The plan is we're still going to have it, and if we move it, it's going to be moved back probably a week. But let's pray for Sam, okay? Let's, let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, um, yeah, we ask for our hearts, God, to bow before you and recognizing that our lives are in your hands. Sam's life is in your hand, and uh, we thank you, God, that he's well enough to communicate. And overall, you know, um, we just want to remember, God, that we entrust all things in life to you. Um, God, we ask that you would bring a supernatural healing if he needs that. Uh, give him a peace that surpasses understanding that comes from Christ alone. God, we thank you for our brother. Thank you that you love him so much, God, and we do too. So we ask that you would comfort him in this time, give him assurance, God, that you um, are with him at this very moment. God, we trust you, and would you bless him, provide for him, God, all things that he needs. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, I don't want to, like, shock anyone. I just, you know, I want to communicate, and, um, yeah, I think he's overall okay. Um, next announcement is for our giving. So we have two ways to give. One is through our online platform at our website, savercommunity.com. You go into uh, the give link there, or you also have an offering box up in front. Um, and our last announcement is for our baptisms. So we're going to have uh, Easter Sunday in a couple of weeks. And if anyone here is a believer and you haven't been baptized yet, I would welcome you um, to get baptized. That's something that the Bible commands, that God desires, and Jesus got baptized. And, you know, it's a way of proclaiming your faith, that you have died with Christ as you go under the water, and you've been raised with Christ as you come up. And so if you have more questions about that, please come and talk to me about that. Um, the deadline to uh, sign up for baptism will be next Sunday, okay? I don't have a slide for this last quick announcement, um, but um, we will be having Good Friday service here. Um, that will be on March 29th, Friday. And that week, we're not going to have our midweek discipleship groups. You know, small groups that week, we're just going to meet here that Friday, okay? So more information will be kind of posted online, and we'll have an announcement slide next week, okay? I'm going to uh, invite up Corey. He's going to be sharing the word with us today. Now, please continue to remember to pray for Sam. You know, he's also a brand new dad. I think his daughter's like 10 weeks old, something like that. I think they were going to bring her today, so we'll see what transpires. It'd be great to, to see the little one. <clears throat> you know, as I shared before, uh, today was Communion Sunday, and thank you for postponing it for one week. And I uh, was going to ask my daughters, both uh, Sunday and Bethany, to uh, sing. And as they're coming forward, um, let me share that what they'll be singing are two songs. It'll be a duet, which talks about the juxtaposition of death and eternity. That death had to happen for us to appreciate and actually have eternity made available to us through Jesus Christ, who came for the purpose of dying so that upon having faith in him, we can live eternity in the presence of the Father. And so this is also to prepare us for communion, which will be happening after, at the conclusion of the message. So be, in, be thinking about that, that death was juxtaposed with eternity, and that death had to happen for us to enjoy eternity. Yes. 
scars will still remain and forever they will say just how much you love me and so I want to say Sunday is the one that's closest to you, and then Bethany is the one that was on the keyboard. You know, all the Suzuki uh, lessons that both the girls actually took 
really pay off as they are now using their gifts and have used their gifts for the Lord. You know, some of you have some remarkable gifts and talents that the Lord has given to you. It could be as a vocalist. It could be on an instrument. It could be with technical things. It could be working with children. Uh, you all have gifts. We all have gifts and talents that God has given to us. And one of the things that it's imp- I think is really important is to take those gifts and you use them for the Lord. I mean, you can use them at work. You use them with your family. But also think about how you can take your gifts and use them uh, for the Lord. So I remember when for Bethany and for uh, Sunday, it took a while for them to use their vocal and instrumental gifts for the Lord. And, but once they did, it became a real blessing to the community of faith. Because I think music is really important in the worship of God and in our relationship with the Lord. Uh, you see it throughout, especially the Old Testament. Uh, there's a whole book dedicated to songs. And um, so I think we need to appreciate that as we worship the Lord and as we uh, worship Him in spirit and in truth. Today the message will focus on the three metaphors of communion. The three metaphors of communion. Did you know that the very first liquid ever poured on the moon and the very first food eaten on the moon were were the body and the blood of Jesus? Uh, Here's uh, some of the first words spoken on the moon were the words of Jesus. Uh, Here's a description of what transpired from USA Today. We'll skip the clip. All right. Actually, there was a clip that I initially wanted to use that they took off of YouTube. Oh, it's there? Yeah, this is actually an interview. Or this, no, this is a report from USA Today. But I don't think we're going to be able to run it. It doesn't look like we're going to run it, but that's okay. We won't run it. But there's actually a movie that was out. I can't remember the movie, but it was about the landing on the moon <clears throat> and the actor in it who portrayed uh, Buzz Aldrin, actually replicated what he did in the the lunar uh, module, where he, one of the first things he wanted to do was to take communion on the moon. So his pastor, he was part of a First Presbyterian church in in his hometown, his pastor blessed and gave him the elements of communion. And each of the astronauts could take like X number of, I don't think it was pounds, I think it was ounces of personal stuff when they went to the moon. And so what he took was a communion set. And so the very first thing he did uh, as they landed on the moon was to share the words of Jesus and then take communion. Now, they did not publicize it. So the people in Houston knew that this happened, but they didn't let the world know because in the um, initial orbiting of the moon, they read uh, Genesis. In the beginning was, and they read it, and then the atheists in America protested so vehemently about it that they decided not to show him taking communion. But the very first liquid and the very first morsel of food eaten on the moon were the body and blood of Jesus. I just thought that was fascinating because it's a very important part of our faith. Now, there are three metaphors used for communion, at least three metaphors used for communion. The body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and the bride of Christ. Body, blood, and bride. Churches normally do a really good job of describing communion as the body and the blood of Jesus. But the metaphor of the bride of Christ being in communion is not as well known, and we don't speak about it very often, so I thought I'd share a little bit about it today. Now, communion was instituted by Jesus on the night before he died at the Passover meal that he ate with his disciples. Jewish people today, Orthodox Jews in particular, still celebrate the Passover meal called the Seder. Here's a picture of a Jewish family, very modern Jewish family, wearing modern clothes, and they celebrate uh, the, the Seder, which is not, not, not communion, but the Seder, the Passover meal, uh, in honor of what God, the Lord had done and in remembrance of what the Lord had done as he brought them out of Egypt. Now, the word communion was used by the early church fathers like St. Augustine, and it's from the Latin. Communion means fellowship, mutual participation, a sharing. It is the participation in something that 
that which is common to all, union in religious worship, doctrine, and discipline. And as part of the ecclesiastical uh, language of the church today, communion. And St. Augustine was very, very influ influential in the early church. Now, the Apostle Paul christened communion as the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20 to 24, thus validating its her historicity. He wrote about it. Now, there is a focus to communion. Now, one of the things I think I shared with you is I coach. If I were a pastor, I'd be a coach. My voice is a little hoarse because we had a tournament yesterday. And when you, if you, you know anything about tournaments and volleyball, I took our high school volleyball team to a tournament, and we played, we got, had, we got on the bus at 6.30 in the morning, and then we uh, didn't end until 8 o'clock that night, and we stayed there the whole day. So the team did really well. So we got into the silver bracket of the tournament, and we got to the finals. That's why we were there till almost 8 o'clock. We lost in three in the finals against a pretty good school, a much bigger school than us, the whole school, Gar High School. But as I teach, I teach athletic skills. And every athletic skill has at least four component parts. One, foundation, which is usually your feet, your legs. Two, form. Every skill has a form. Then three is focus. There's always a focus. Like when you play baseball, you watch the ball. Right? And then there's a follow-through. Almost every skill has an appropriate follow-through. Like when you see people play tennis, a lot of times they don't have a follow-through. They try to hit the ball and they stop. When you actually you have to have a follow-through if you're going to be a good tennis player. Well, communion has a foundation, a form, a focus, and a follow-through. The focus of communion is Jesus. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, the focus of communion is Jesus. So let's take a look at the three metaphor which helps us to focus on Jesus when we take communion. First, the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So the bread represents the body of Christ. Now, we Protestants believe that the bread represents the body of Christ, symbolically represents the body of Christ, and therefore is used as a metaphor. Now, I always share with church families, if you have a fairly devout Catholic friend and you want to invite them to church, do not invite them on a communion Sunday. Because Orthodox Catholics view communion differently. When the father or the priest bless it, they believe that the loaf and the cup actually becomes the body and the blood of Jesus. And so they wouldn't necessarily agree with the way in which we handle the elements of communion. Like in the Catholic Church, in the back, they have a sink where they wash out the cup and stuff, and the drain goes directly into the ground because they don't want it to go into the sewer because even the remnants of what they use for communion is actually the part of the body and blood of Jesus. So be careful inviting Catholics, uh, your Catholic friends, to a, a communion service. Now, a metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word or phrase literally denoting one kind of object or idea is used in place of another to suggest a likeness or analogy between them as in drowning in money. That's the metaphor. Now, let me give you some common metaphors. I'm going to have you fill in the blank. No grade. All right? Just fill in the blanks. Here are common metaphors. At least they're common metaphors, but I don't know if they're that common for your age group, but I want to find out. America is a blank pot. Now, what's the answer? Melting pot. Right? That's a metaphor. The world is a blank. The common metaphor there is stage. The world is a stage. Life is a blank. What would you put in? Well, the common one is roller coaster. <laughs> An amusement park metaphor. He is a night blank. Owl, night owl, means he stays up at night, late. My dad is a road blank. <laughs> a road rager, no, no. 
a road hog. Right. The twins are like two blanks in a pod. Peas, right? These are all metaphors, common metaphors that we're aware of. The bread of communion is a metaphor for Jesus' body. Right? Now, how was the bread used in the Seder in a, or the Passover meal? We're not talking about communion, but the Passover meal celebrated by Jews in commemoration of being rescued out of Egypt. Now, here's a picture of matzah bread. So they used unleavened bread. Now, this is what it looks like. Note that matzah bread is unleavened, meaning no yeast in it, so it doesn't rise. Two, this matzah bread is striped. And three, it is pierced. Right. Now, what they would do at the Passover meal is they would take three pieces of matzah bread, and they would wrap it in a cloth, and they would bring it to the Seder table, not at the beginning. What they would do is they would take this, and they would hide it somewhere in the house. It's a great thing for families, you know, for Jewish families. They would hide it someplace. And then at the appropriate moment, the children would go out and try to find this. And then the one who found it would bring it to the Seder table. It was hidden for the children to find. Now, in the white wrapping or cloth, they place three pieces of matzah bread. Three pieces of matzah bread. It almost feels like I'm doing a magic trick, but there's no magic here, okay? I'm not going to make it disappear or anything. All right. Of the three, they would take the middle piece the middle piece of the matzah, and they would break it. And the middle matzah is a symbol of brokenness because life has its seasons and moments of brokenness, which we all have experienced. The middle bread is the one that Jesus used in the, first, in the Passover meal, which became the first communion that we celebrate today. Now, remember that the Messiah is symbolically sprinkled throughout the Seder of the Passover. In other words, if you look at different parts of the Old Testament, you will see Jesus in it. Because God, as he wrote the story of redemption, which is from the fall to, to the, through the resurrection and even into, re, into the book of Revelation, God sprinkled Jesus, the Christ, into every, almost every story or every facet of redemption history, even especially in the Passover meal. So Orthodox Jews do not understand it until they come to know Jesus that the Passover meal they celebrate every year has Christ in it. And I think especially in the matzah bread, striped and pierced, as it says in Isaiah. He was striped and pierced for our sake. The bread was the middle of the three. And we know God, the triune God, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus being the middle person of the Trinity, one God. Again, it's striped, just as Jesus was beaten and striped, the Bible says. It is pierced, just like his hands were pierced and his feet were pierced on the cross. It is unleavened. And what does leaven represent in the New Testament? Sin. But this bread is unleavened. Jesus was like unleavened bread because he had no sin. Little wonder why the bread was used to represent metaphorically the body of Christ from the Passover meal. Again, we can see Jesus throughout the Passover meal, throughout it. But we're just looking at one element, the institution of communion. <clears throat> now, Jesus was following the liturgy of the Passover meal perfectly until it became time to actually eat the bread, the middle piece of matzah. When he took the bread and he broke it, he departed from the time-honored liturgy 
and said something that had never been said before in a Passover meal. This is where he departed from the Passover meal, the Seder. Matthew 26, 26 will be on the screen. He said this. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. That had never, ever been said at any Passover meal previous to that one. The Last Supper, which became the institution of communion. Thus, the metaphor of Jesus being the body, the body of Jesus being the bread was established. Now, what about the blood of Jesus? The cup metaphorically represented the blood of Christ. Now, why blood? Let me place this over here. Why blood? Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are cleansed with blood. And according to the law and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So shedding of blood was required for forgiveness to be granted. Why did God require blood? I'm not sure. He just instituted and said the shedding of blood, and blood is needed to cleanse sin. I do know that in the Old Testament, blood represented life, and that the sacrifice of blood from a lamb was required for forgiveness of sin. That's throughout the Old Testament. You may ask, well, we now live under grace, so why was the sacrifice required? The answer is yes, we live under grace. However, grace came into effect after the death of Jesus. That was the act of grace and mercy from God. Therefore, death was required and blood needed to be shed. Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill it. That's what Jesus said. So the law says there has to be the shedding of blood from a sacrificial lamb for forgiveness of sin, for the cleansing of sin. And what did Jesus do? He came to fulfill it, not to abolish it, but to fulfill it. How? He became the perfect lamb of God without sin. And when Jesus died and shed blood, his blood washed away our sins for all time for anybody who believes in Jesus. Right? He justified us. He made us righteous at that moment when we confess our faith. The Seder was continuing in the lives of Jesus and the disciples. The bread had already been broken. They had eaten the bread. Then he took the cup. Right? And he said something extremely astonishing. And Matthew recorded it in this way. Matthew 26, 27 to 28. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. All right, now that's normal. Then there's a departure. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sin. A major departure from the time-honored tradition of Seder, the Passover meal. Now, more about the cup in a moment. Now, think about it. This was the Passover meal Jesus used to institute communion. Passover happened when the angel of death passed over the homes that had been smeared with blood. That's the account in Exodus. During Passover, the high priest would sacrifice an unblemished lamb, sprinkle its blood on the mercy seat of God to atone for the sins of the people of Israel. It was the perfect time to inaugurate communion. And the Passover meal was the perfect moment to establish this thing we now know as communion. So this brings us to the third metaphor, the bride of Christ. Now this one is very seldom explained, you know, because really the body and the blood of Jesus really is represented in the elements very clearly, whereas the bride of Christ is not, not in when we take communion and the way in which we take it. The Bible never explicitly calls the church the bride of Christ, but it definitely alludes to it numerous times. 
For example, Ephesians 5.23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Paul equates Christ, Christ and the church, Christ being the groom, the church being the what? The bride. Revelation 19.7 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory for, to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Jesus is the Lamb and the bride is his church, being prepared to be taken up to heaven someday. 2 Corinthians 11.2 says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin, using the metaphor as Jesus being the groom and the church being his bride. The parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25 to 30, 1 to 13. Jesus is the bridegroom, and the ten virgins represent those who are prepared to meet the bridegroom, that is, the church. That's us. Isaiah 62 5, for as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Equating God with the groom and, and us being the church, or being the bride. Now, how does it relate to the Passover meal and the institution of communion by Jesus? Now, there were four cups on the Passover table. Four cups. Those four cups represent the four I will statements by God in Exodus 6, 6 to 7. In the order of occurrence in Exodus and the consumption from the cups. So four I will statements from Exodus that God said, I will. And then they took the cup in the sequence that it appears in Exodus. Now, what are the four cups from Exodus? First is the cup of sanctification. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. See, out of bondage into freedom. That's Exodus 6, 6, the first portion. Then there comes the second cup, was the cup of judgment. I will deliver you from their bondage, bringing judgment upon the people of, of Egypt. Then the fourth, third cup was the cup of redemption. I will redeem you with the outstretched arm and with great judgments. And then the fourth cup was the cup of praise. I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. Just think of how they felt about that, coming out of, out of, the, uh, out of bondage. I will be your God. So what happens? Um, this is a side note. So what happens? They go, they get delivered, they go through the Red Sea, and then they, they become disobedient, and they wander for 40 years. Why do they have to wander? Well, for a couple of reasons. But one reason is God creates a people while they're wandering. One whole generation passes away, and a new group of people come into being, and that becomes more so God's people, a nation of Israel. They became a nation in the wilderness. Now, Jesus used a third cup for the very first communion. So remember, there's four. He used cup number three. Now, how do we know it was the third cup? Well, in Luke 22, verse 20, it says, and in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup was poured out for you as a new covenant in my blood. So we can identify the third cup by what Jesus said because it was the cup that he used after they had eaten the meal. The first two cups were consumed during the meal. Hence, it had to be the third cup because after they had eaten, he presented the third cup. So we know it was the third cup. What was the third cup? The cup of redemption. God said, I will redeem you. And the next words are incredibly revealing. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And that, to me, that's a picture of the crucifixion. The outstretched arms of Jesus. I will redeem you with outstretched arms. Right there in the Seder, the Passover meal, God is describing the crucifixion of Jesus. This is the Christ of the Passover. But what about the fourth cup? Because there's no mention really of the fourth cup directly 
in the Passover meal that Jesus experienced with his disciples. The fourth cup was the cup of praise. I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. But that's never spoken. In fact, it seems like it terminates after the third cup, the cup of redemption, and he institutes communion. And then the narrative ceases. Jesus probably did not drink, and, or the disciples, from the fourth cup on that communion Sunday, or on that communion uh, Thursday. Matthew 26, 29 says, but I say to you, he said this instead, but I say to you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I think that was a reference to the fourth cup, the cup of praise. I'm not going to drink of this cup until we meet again. When? Where? Heaven. At the, where? At the king's table. And what cup will be at the king's table? You don't need the first three cups. You've already been redeemed, which is the third cup. But rather, it's the cup of praise. Because that's the cup we'll be drinking from when we're in heaven. The fourth cup. The cup of praise. Look at the words again. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. These words of Jesus are his promise to us that he will return for us and that we will drink it together at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is described later in the Bible. Is this a beautiful picture of communion? The bride of Christ? We are the bride and he is the groom. So whenever we partake of communion, we are reenacting the very first communion in remembrance of our bridegroom. Now we're going to prepare our hearts to partake communion, and Sunday and Bethany are going to take their positions, and they're going to sing a song. They'll be sharing a song with us that paints a picture of what I just shared about communion. Now, you should all have the elements that were on your seats. If you've never used this little portable set that has become the standard bearer now since COVID, right? There's a clear Sullivan that you peel back and that exposes the bread. And then you peel back the aluminum one and it exposes the juice. Right? So you may want to gently do that now just to prepare yourselves because sometimes it takes a moment or two. Right? And just hold it and we'll partake together. We'll do it together. So, the, so Bethany and Sunday will sing a song and then I'm going to read a devotional written by Ray Vanderland. And listen, listen to, um, to the reading about the third cup of the bride of Christ. The reading will explain where Jesus got the words he used for the third cup and how it relates to the bride of Christ in communion. Remember the third cup, the cup of redemption? He drank of it, but he added meaning to it. That, that we can glean from a historical, traditional perspective of a bride in Israel in that day. And it'll be, I think it'll become clear. So Lord, we pray that you will bless this time we now have and prepare our hearts for what will be sung. And thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us and continue to do for us through communion and your life and our lives. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Before Jesus went to the cross, he and his disciples observed the Seder. He had the special last meals with his followers, his friends. They partook of the food and practiced the liturgy of the meal. Unbeknownst to the disciples, Jesus was about to reinterpret one of the cups of the Passover meal, and its two will become known as communion. During the days of Jesus, there was a wonderful first century custom for marriage. The groom and his father would meet with the bride-to-be and her father and negotiate a price for the marriage. The price was not for the purchase of a bride, but to replace the great loss of a daughter to a father. The price was often very high. It could have been equivalent to the cost of a house. When the price was agreed upon, the custom was that the young man's father would pour a cup of wine and hand it to his son. His son would turn to the woman and lift the cup and hold it out to her and say, This cup is a new covenant in my blood which I offer to you. The young man was essentially saying, I love you and I will give you my life will you marry me? The woman had a choice to make. She could take the cup and give it back, thus saying no to the offer of love. Or she could choose to answer without saying a word. She would accept the cup and drink, thus saying, I accept your offer and I give you my life. For Jesus and the disciples, it was time to drink from the third cup the special cup of the Passover, the cup of redemption. They all knew the liturgy of the Passover. They had experienced it and practiced it since they were children. They had heard it over and over each year of their lives. They knew what was to come. Jesus lifted the third cup and offered thanks. Blessed are you, the Lord our God, King of the universe, for giving us the fruit of the vine. And then he held it up to them and said something they didn't expect, something that wasn't a part of the time-honored liturgy of the Passover. He said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which I offer to you. What was Jesus doing? What was he saying? Jesus was saying in common, ordinary, everyday language to those disciples, I love you. He was telling them that the only picture that would describe the power of my love for you is the power of the passionate, pure love of a husband for his wife. It's difficult to know how the disciples individually responded to Jesus' marriage proposal in the midst of the Passover meal. It probably seemed totally out of place. On the other hand, maybe they understood the passion and the power of Jesus' love for them. He was willing to die, be buried, and eventually rise from the grave to say, I love you, and as my Father promised, I am willing to pay the price for you.
bride of Christ, how beautiful you are to Jesus, our bridegroom. As we are about to partake of the bread, hear the bridegroom declare to his beloved, I love you and I will give my life. Will you marry me? I am willing to pay the price for you. With this in mind, bride of Jesus, let us partake of the bread together. now as we are about to drink from the cup. Hear the bridegroom as he says, Blessed are you, the Lord, our God, King of the universe, for giving us the fruit of the vine. This is a new covenant in my blood, which I offer to you. And now let us drink. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time we had to celebrate communion. Lord God, we, we thank you that, that you decided to come to earth, to go to the cross, to suffer tremendous humiliation, and then to die, that we may have eternal life. The nails in your hand, which lead to eternity. We give you thanks for this, Father. And we praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now we'll worship the Lord. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, what fears are still. When striving seeks my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I say. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, the fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. And on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Lay here in the depth of Christ. There in the ground, his body lay, a light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth. Glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost. 
lost its grip on me For I am His and He is mine I'm bought with the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life, no fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Could ever pluck me from his hands Till he returns or calls me home is your blood. God, we are thankful that you are so gracious to pay the price, God, for our sins. And we thank you, God, that we have a very powerful, beautiful, and simple way to remember you, to remember what you've done for us, 
communicate your love that is unending, that is unconditional. Father, we are so grateful that we can do this as the body of Christ together, as your bride. God, help us to treasure your sacrifice and to remember you even outside of our Sunday gathering, outside of the worship service, Lord. God, you gave us the cup of redemption and you redeemed our lives for a purpose, and that is to live into your glory and delight in you. And so, God, I pray that we would uh, live lives, God, that do glorify you as a response to the redemption that you've already provided. God, we look forward to drink the fourth cup. We thank you for your invitation to the kingdom. God, we recognize, Lord, that is a promise for us from now until you return. And so we cling to it by faith. We praise the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the rendering of the benediction, my daughter Sunday will be staying for lunch, and then Bethany's husband, Brian, along with uh, Bailey, Bryn, Brenna, and Bria, will be staying for lunch. Bethany's off to a Foster the City meeting right now, which uh, her busy day is on Sundays when she visits with churches to help uh, those who are fostering kids and churches to support those who are fostering kids within the church family. So pray for her. Now receive the blessing of the benediction. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his confidence upon you and give you joy, peace, and holiness all the days of your lives. And may you always live a life being the very bride of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Um, please join us for lunch outside. Uh, we'll have lunch served, fellowship with us, break bread. And then if you want to stay in here to reflect upon the sermon, you're welcome to, to pray. All right. God bless you guys.